1 Thessalonians 2, and we'll read from verse number 1. Verse number 1, for yourselves, uh, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. For our, uh, uh, for our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time use we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness, nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail. For laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As ye know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you the belief. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us, and they please not God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always, for the, for, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavoured the more abundantly to see you, to see your face with great desire. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope, or joy, or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. And we look to God tonight just to help us as we look through these verses and need to bless them to us as we consider them tonight together. Now, the great big pitfall of a meeting like this, where you're working your way through a book, is that for five successive months, you'll get five entirely different outlines and five entirely different um, summaries of the book. I will not fall into that pitfall for you tonight, um, but that uh, just leaves you the other three, the other three brethren to do the same. Now, uh, we won't do that, but we do need just to recognize, just, and as we come to our chapter this evening, that, that it... The, the church at Thessalonica, we might say was this, was born in troubled times. It was a difficult set of circumstances. We might say that the Apostle Paul was effectively drummed out of town and he was driven out of Thessalonica and they moved on to Berea, as you recall the record of the book of Acts in chapter 17 and 18. So they were difficult times. And yet a church for God was planted in Thessalonica. We should not lose sight of that tonight, that God works regardless of the circumstances around. And although it was difficult, and it was very difficult, nevertheless, there was established at Thessalonica a testimony for God. And Paul writes to these dear people in this letter and the next. And so it was a church born in troubled times. But we can say of them, as we look at the book just briefly, they were, we might say, an enthusiastic church. We read, if you read back, remember in chapter one, he talks about them, that you were in samples, examples to all that believe in Macedonia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia and so on, but across the world. They were an enthusiastic church. I think it would have been quite, quite, a, quite a thing to have been amongst the people of God at Thessalonica. They were keen in the gospel. The word of the Lord sounded out from them 
very widely, an enthusiastic church. But I would suggest to you in our chapter tonight, I'm going to, I'm going to draw over a title for it. They were a threatened church. And I might wonder why, and we'll come back to our chapter in a moment, why it is that Paul defends through the majority of our verses his preaching at Thessalonica. I judge that in his absence, Paul, there were those who had come to Thessalonica who had whispered in the ears of the Christians there, Paul, dodgy. His message, not good. His motives, not pure. His methods, questionable. And you are therefore, what he's brought to you, not worth hearing. And Paul will defend, in the majority of our chapter tonight, his message and his motives and his methods. And that's why this chapter, so they were threatened. But there was a defense that's given in our chapter. They were well, not only that, they were troubled. There was difficulties at Thessalonica. If you just cast your eye into chapter three, I'm not stealing somebody else's territory. We notice that no man should be moved by these afflictions where until you're appointed. And he talks about their suffer tribulation. And so look at the words that he uses. They were a troubled church. They were, they were, they were threatened. There were difficulties. There were afflictions. Persecution came to Thessalonica. But not only that, they were an encouraging church. Look at verse number seven of chapter three. We were comforted over you in all our afflictions. And so something of Thessalonica had brought joy to the heart of, the, of, of Paul and those that were with him. And what a wonder that was, that these believers brought that to them. And when we come into chapter four, I would suggest to you that they were an anxious church. What of the future? After all, they had seen dear saints of God pass away. And they were uncertain as to how the days would unfold. And he reveals to them wonderfully truth that uh, uh, chapter, you know, chapter three, sorry, chapter four and chapter five, where, where countless saints of God have found comfort ever since. And remember that Paul ends chapter four, wherefore comfort ye one another with these words. And this church that was anxious found comfort in the truth that the Lord is coming. And in fact, it's the thread that runs through, as you well know right through the book in every single chapter. So that's, that's my attempt to give you the background to the book. And then we'll look at our chapter tonight. And, 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 and I want to suggest that what we have in chapter one is the power of the gospel, but chapter two is the preachers of the gospel. And so he's going to defend, Paul will give his defense. And as we think of it tonight, I don't want us to think of it particularly as a defense. It is that. It is that primarily. But rather for us to just take the lessons for ourselves of what does it actually mean to, to, to work for God? And what, does it, what should characterize us in our work for the Lord? And Paul's going to give the characteristics of the work in verses 1 to 12. And then reading from verse 13 to the end of the chapter, he's going to give us the effect of that work. What was the effect on the people of God at Thessalonica? And so we'll think about the, 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 to what it is, the character of the work, and then the effect of the work. So we're going to think, first of all, tonight about the circumstances in which Paul found himself working. I want to notice, please, what he says to them. That he says to them, for, for, your, for yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you. Now, I want you to notice, please, that that's a theme that's going to come up time and again. Look down, please, at verse number Two, you will notice, but um, he says that as ye know. And again, look down at verse number five, as ye know. And verse number nine, as ye remember. And verse number 10, ye are witnesses. And verse number 11, as ye know. You notice he's keep drawing attention not to the fact that they knew this. They remembered it, they'd seen it, they'd been witness to it. And time and again, what Paul is telling them the, in his ministry, it was transparent. This should be really clear for tonight that in the work of God there is a need for transparency. The others can look in and see and there is nothing hidden because we have nothing to hide. We have absolutely nothing to hide. The truth of God is something that can stand on a pedestal quite frankly and be seen by all. There is nothing to hide. And what a wonderful book that we hold and a wonderful message that we bring and a wonderful God that we speak of. There is nothing to hide. And we shouldn't be, we should therefore be careful that we don't somehow look secretive 
Paul says, you know, you remember this. You saw it. You were witnesses. All this was real. There was nothing to hide. It was a transparent ministry. Now, not just what he goes on to tell them. He says, knowing our entrance in unto you. Now, it wasn't just the fact that they came to Thessalonica. And, of course, the apostle Paul did. It wasn't just their arrival. But the thought behind that is our time with you. In other words, in, in the, and it was a relatively short period of time that they were at Thessalonica. They had been entirely consistent with them. So as they look back from the very first day that they met the apostle, right to the last day when they left, and now as he takes up his pen to write to them, there was a consistency that Paul had with them. And again, as we take the lesson for ourselves tonight, there should be a consistency in the, in the way in which we work for God and a consistency in the way that we, that we deal with one another. And it's not just the, the first meeting. Oh, that was quite a good one. Oh, yeah, but it goes downhill after that. We can all make, we all make a fairly good impression once. It's a little harder to keep it up, isn't it? But you know what? Paul says it was consistent all the way through. Well, not just please that. He says that our entrance in unto you was not in vain. That's a lovely phrase there. It was not without result, without consequence. And, and the thought is this, that it was a, min, a ministry in which they imparted something. I've called it this. It was a giving ministry. What I mean by that is this, that as the Apostle Paul served amongst the, the, the people there in Thessalonica, and saw individuals saved. It wasn't for what Paul could get back from them. And he was going to defend that again and again in this chapter. It's what he could give to them. It's what he put in, not what he took out. And therefore, and, and it was effective in doing that. The, Thessalon the, the Thessalonians were the beneficiaries of this. And it was be the, bene the fundamental beneficiary was this. Their lives were changed through the gospel. And he says it wasn't in vain, we gave. But just to think, think of our attitude, as we think of the circumstances in this chapter, there was a giving ministry. And last of all, in this, just this verse number two again, he talks about suffering and shamefully entreated. Philippi, and finally when they got to Thessalonica, it seemed to chase them along, didn't it, the suffering. And one of what he's telling us this, it was a persevering ministry. Didn't give no, it's easy to give up, throw in the towel, had enough, we're done. But Paul says no, and he pressed on. And I want to notice why was that? Because they were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God. And I take it that this is the two resources that he's going to lay hold, bold in God. That was the first thing. He did, they laid hold on a divine Resource. Our boldness does not come because some of us are perhaps loud of character and tall of height or whatever. And, you know, we've all met those individuals who, who don't seem to have any problem being in the middle of all, all of that stuff. No, no, no. It's not about, it's not our natural ability, he says. It was a boldness that came from tapping into divine resource, bold in God. But secondly, now he says he talks about the gospel of God. And I take it that what spurred the apostle on in the difficult times was this, was realizing that he held in his hand, as it were, in his responsibility, a work which was divine in its very character, the gospel of God. And if it was a divine work that was given, a divine message to convey, then Paul says, I'm not giving up. I mean, of all the jobs one could have, all the jobs one could have, Paul says, I mean, trusted with the gospel of God. Now, what a privilege is Paul. That's why I'm not giving up. And so he persevered through divine resource and a sense of being entrusted with a divine work. Now, I don't know how it is with you, but I suggest these four principles we can all lay hold on. In the little sphere that we find ourselves in and the circumstances in which we stand, these four little principles we can hold on to. Our work for God should be transparent. Nothing to hide. Our work should be consistent. Our work should be that which is giving. In other words, that there should be, it's not for what I get, it's what you get. And our work should be that which we persevere in, even when it gets difficult, because we can lay hold of divine resource and we realize we've been given a divine work. It's the gospel 
of God. Now he says, so we get now says, the, 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 the motives for his work, really, in verses three and four, but we're gonna have to put our foot on the gas a little bit. And I want to notice, first of all, that he gives it, first of all, the negatives, what he was not. And so he says to them in verse three, for it was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. What it was negatively. Now I want you to notice that he uses the word here, which is for our exhortation, our appeal to you. It's a lovely word when you think about it in the gospel. It, it, it is the word that's the Greek word for which ultimately, remember the word the rest of the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the paraclete. It's the same, it's the same root word, the drawer alongside. Now he says in this exhaltation in the gospel, you know, Paul, I mean, may well have stood on a on a proverbial soapbox as he preached. He may have been in that sense, he may have stood and declared, but there was a sense always in it of drawing alongside. It wasn't a distant ministry. It was actually with, as you'll talk later on. And so it was an exhortation in that sense. And it says, not of deceit. The really thought behind it is this, not of error. Remember the whisperers in the ears of the Thessalonians? You can hear them, can't you? These people say, you know what? Not sure of this stuff. It's dodgy. Error. Paul says, no, it wasn't. I have a sure and certain foundation. That is the word of God. Revealed divine truth. And on that basis, we can have total and absolute confidence. And therefore, we are not peddling opinion. We are dealing with divine certainty. It was not of deceit, not of error, nor of uncleanness. You remember, that again, the whispering in the ears that were going on in Thessalonica. Paul is morally questionable. Morally questionable. And his teaching, you know, oh, takes you down a difficult road. Paul says that's never the gospel. That's <clears> never <throat> the work of God. It is something that is absolutely, absolutely moral, right, straight, up and down, we might say. And it, and it regenerates that in its character in those who listen. And that the same morality, if you like, the same cleanness, if I might borrow our word, should be the consequence in the lives of those who hear the gospel. So he says it's not like that, not of uncleanness, nor of deceit. And it's back to our transparency word again. And so there's nothing for us to be ashamed of in the gospel, nothing for us to hide. He says there is nothing of which we need to be embarrassed over. The gospel is a grand message in every aspect of it. but something to rejoice in. So it's as he says, says it, that's what it wasn't. But now he gives it us positively. I love these phrases that we get in verse number for look what he says he says but as we were allowed of god and what a lovely phrase that is the thought is this is, is of allowed approved if you like prepared of god now as the as the, the man handling the gospel paul says as a servant of the lord prepared of god and that must be true of every servant of the lord in whatever service we find ourselves, whether it is public preaching or any other form of service, it matters not, prepared of God. That means there must have been time with God. There must therefore have been consideration of the things of God and a heart that was open to the things of God, approved, prepared. It touches us, doesn't it? Are we prepared of God? But secondly, he talks about being put in Trust, you notice know, the language, put into it. We were trusted by God. Trusted by God. Some of you know my daughter got married um, last weekend. And, um, and courtesy of the company she worked for, she got taken to the wedding in a Rolls Royce. And I have to say, I got a quick trip around the block in a Rolls Royce. And probably the first and last time it ever happened to me. It was one of those moments, there you go. But I'll tell you what didn't happen. The guy never gave me the keys. <laughs> he never gave me the keys. I was not trusted by the man from Rolls Royce with the keys. But think for a moment. The God of heaven has trusted humanity. People like you and me. With the greatest thing this world will ever hear. The gospel of God. Trusted. 
What a stewardship is ours. Put into our hands something that is not put into the hands of angels. They don't hold it. But you and I do. Now, what a privilege. Trusted. Entrusted by God. What a stewardship that is ours. And therefore, that means that in our discharge of our responsibility in service for God, and there's a, there's a certain um, bias in these verses towards the gospel, but I don't think it is just as gospel as we will see in a moment. In the work of God in whatever form, there therefore has to come with it a dignity, I judge. We've been entrusted with this thing by God. And so that's the, the wonder that you might, and we should discharge it then with a sense of responsibility. We have been trusted by God. But not only that, it is something that was honoring to God. Look at the, again the language here. He says that I'm um, being put in trust with the gospel, not as pleasing men, but God. So in terms of therefore, it, it, it's, he thinks of his, his motive, in this is it was that he would be honoring God. I say it carefully tonight. It doesn't matter what you think about the preacher tonight. It actually doesn't. Because ultimately you don't sit on the judgment seat of Christ. Somebody else does. And that's the Lord Jesus. And so my service for him is assessed by God. It doesn't, that's not an arrogant statement. Let me just be clear. Because it is about pleasing God and not pleasing them. And so therefore we move to honour God. And therefore that we are, what we do is for him, says Paul, not for men. And so it changes the nature of our service and our view of it. And Paul sets it out as his and his motives. Now he gives us now his methods from verses 5 to 12. Now he's going to describe the methods First, in verses 5 to 8, and he does the same little thing again. He does the negative and the positive. So he says, neither at any time, verse 5, did we use flattering words. Well, flattering. We can all do it. But what a danger that is amongst the things of God, whether in the gospel or whether in the teaching of the Lord's people. Flattering words. A message that effectively um, has no um, value but it is flattering words, as he calls it here, it, it potentially, as you'll notice, actually, you know, nor a cloak of covetousness. And, and the allegation that was clearly being given here was, Paul has buttered you up because he wants the content of your pocket. He wants your money. He wants your money. And so he's using flattering words in order to extract from you benefit for himself. You know, it's not, again, says Paul, it wasn't like that. We set out plainly the truth of God, not hiding the, if you like, the offense of the gospel, the challenge of the gospel. Set out plainly divine truth because it was for your good, not, says Paul, for what I might gain, not with flattering words. But not only that, he says, he says, not a cloak of covetousness. The work of God has no space for my personal gain. There is no space for it. It's not of covetousness. Neither says, and, 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 and therefore all the glory as a consequence must belong to God. And not only that, he says, he says, nor sought we glory. There's no desire for profit for self, neither of you nor of others, when we, when we might have been made burdensome, he says. So whilst it is appropriate that the Lord's servants can live of the gospel, if I might borrow that language elsewhere, the apostles writing. And he'll talk about not muzzling the ox that treads the corn. And there is an appropriateness in there. And if they have ministered unto a spiritual things, then it's not inappropriate to minister carnal, you know, physical things in return. It, but that's not his argument here. What he's saying is, what is my motive for doing it? Paul says, whilst it might be appropriate to receive, it was never my motive in the sight. It was rather that it would be for the glory of God. Now, he's going to set it out positively, and that's where I want to really uh, look at these verses. He says, but we were gentle among you. Now, I want to just notice the, the, the lovely statements that he sets out. So the first number seven, he'll talk about their gentleness among them. It was a behavior that really touched them. He was gentle among them. It's a lovely word, isn't it? Yeah, but the apostle was never 
dictatorial. He was never harsh. There are occasions I judge that he must have set out some fairly tough things. We've only got to turn our way back to the, the language of 1 Corinthians, for example. There were some fairly tough things that needed on occasions to be said. And we'll find that likewise in some of the other epistles. But his basic characteristic was of gentleness among them. And he's going to use a little phrase later on, as a nurse cherishes her children, as a nursing mother. And, 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 and many of us will, you know, we've either, you know, some of us, I look around the audience, some of you have done it for real, and the rest of us have seen it for real. And let's put it like that. And we've seen, we've seen what it is, that cherishing of a nursing mother and a tender care and a wanting to impart and, it's something, and, and so that was, his, that was his attitude, his behavior. And so that was the behavior that touched them. But here was his position among them. Notice the language, among you. If you, to, if you were to turn over to 1 Peter 5, you'll discover the same language used in relation to overseers in the local assembly. Among, among. And so Paul, as his ministry was among, not over. It was among, in that tender place of being among them. He could, he could be sacrificial as a nursing mother. And the same point is this, that in a nursing mother, she is giving of herself to her children. Very simply. Not just the protection and the love and the care, but physically. She's giving of herself for her children. And so he says, it was like that among you. Now, what a tenderness that marked the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Paul is challenging us, a judge. What marks the characteristic of the way in which we serve the people of God and how we, would, how, how we operate amongst them? And it's not just the preacher on the platform tonight. It is all of us that find ourselves scrutinized by these verses. And so he says that was it. That was his first thing. There was a gentleness among them. But verse number eight, he also had a desire Towards them. And this is really building on the language of verse 7. This was true shepherd care that he had for them in verse number 8. That if affectionately desirous that we might impart something to you of our own souls. It was insufficient to the apostle that he brought the gospel to them. Wonderful though that was. But actually that he would give them something more. That they would be richly Blessed, not just the language he uses, of their own soul, something of the inner being, something that was that was of, of, of spiritual in its very character. Why? Because you were dear unto us. It's an interesting little phrase. It's you were beloved of us. And, and it's the root word that that is that word agape. Love that is divine in character. We've loved you like God has loved you. That's a remarkable statement. Now he says that's the love they had. And in their service, he was, he was reflecting to them something of the love of God. Now, as we think of our conduct with one another, and think of the way we would minister amongst one another, that's the characteristics that he sets out as a nursing mother cherishing, and as one displaying something of the very love of God. That was Paul in the church of Thessalonica. And that's the challenge he says to us as we move amongst one another today. That was his characteristics. But I want to notice, please, please that was seen, them, thing, the, their, their, their methods seen positively. But I want to notice, please, not just the methods described, but their methods remembered. I want to notice verse number nine. For ye Remember. Now you notice that all the way through this, you get those, you remember, and then verse number 10, ye are witnesses, and verse number 11, as ye know. So these three occasions, remember and witness and know, calling back to mind for these people exactly what had happened, how they had been. And the first memory they had was this the memory of their selflessness, our labor. And travel. Now, I take it what he's actually referring to is not their labor in spiritual things, but actually, Paul worked hard at whatever the day job was. In fact, it wasn't actually the day job because he calls it laboring night and day. So, clearly, it wasn't just the day job. He, he labored in order that they would not be chargeable unto the church at Thessalonica, the believers at Thessalonica. So, he earned his own crust. 
if I might put it rather crudely. He earned his own crust. And it meant that he had to work hard. Labour night and day. And the words labour and travel, work that caused weariness. Travel, work that was intense. So there was some hard labour that went here. Night and day, inconvenient to say the very least. Why did he do all of that? So that he would not be chargeable to them. Can I just turn this around just for a moment? Because what we're saying to them is this. His service among them was utterly selfless. He did all of that for one reason. That the gospel would preach, be preached among them without charge, without cost. And so really what he's saying is, is what are we really prepared to put into the work of God? Because he was prepared to put up with this. You know, working at the day job, the menial, the 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 the, the certainly that the, the, the humdrum, the ordinary, in order that there might be an ability to work in the spiritual. And he actually saw the two things standing side by side. I wonder sometimes whether we've lost sight what it is actually to work hard. Because he was hard and inconvenient, night and day in order that there might be an opportunity to serve amongst God's people. It's a huge challenge. It's a huge challenge. We have become comfortable, I think. And it comes out that our spiritual life is, a, is when it is convenient. When it's convenient. If I can just squeeze it in, perhaps, maybe. And we will not prioritize in the way Paul did. So he slogged himself to death, frankly, at night, in order he might labor amongst them in the day. He labored hard. And it was his labors in his secular to enable him to be amongst them in the gospel. Now, that was selflessness. But not only that, but they not only remembered the selflessness, they remembered the holiness. Verse number 10. Witnesses, we were holy and justly and unblameably among them. So when you looked at the character of the Apostle Paul, there was nothing questionable, no appearance of evil. His conduct was to the highest possible standard, righteously. And it was unblameable. It would withstood external scrutiny. That's pretty high standard. That's what's asked of us in the work of God. Holy, justly, unblameable. That our conduct can face that scrutiny. It's a high line that's drawn. Paul says, that's where it was. And you knew that, he says. You witnessed this, he said. That was my conduct. The third standard thing he'll put out to them is this. And it's verse number 11 and 12. He says, as you know, as we exhorted and comforted and charge. So we've had the memory of his selflessness, and the memory of his holiness, and now the memory of his care. Now the operative phrase in the middle there is verse number 11, as a father doth his children. Now you'll notice that he's moved the, the, the language, he's moved from a nursing mother, and there is the tender care, the, the giving care of the nursing mother. But now it's a father and his child. And, and fathers are not like mothers. I'm not trying to teach you the obvious, but I uh, but it is a fact. Um, and, and there is plenty of stuff that fathers can't do. Not equipped, frankly. But there is something we do do. And there is something here that he says the responsibility of the father's care. And it's care. You'll notice that. And he calls it as a father. Yeah, and what was it? We exhorted, comforted, and charged. He's got three statements. There are three uh, aspects of this exhortation. A word to the careless or the indifferent. It's a strong appeal. That's the word the exhortation is. It's a strong appeal. And so as a father amongst these believers, there may have been some who had become a little indifferent, a little careless, a little slapdash, should we say. It's spiritual things. They need it. A bit of a tug. A sharp word. A strong word. Exhorting. 
And then there were some who needed to be comforted. A word to the faint-hearted or the discouraged. And that would have been a rather different word, I think. And he knew saints that were finding the way just a bit harder. And perhaps felt a bit squashed. And a bit, well, they were down. And they needed comforting. After all, he's going to do that in this letter. Still in chapter four. I'm not allowed to go there tonight, but you know what's in chapter four. And you know what's there. Yeah, wherefore comfort is there. And in their sorrow, a word of comfort. And so he says there was a word to the faint-hearted, a word to the, to those discouraged. And then he says to them, he says also, and to charge. And the thought behind it is that it's a warning. A warning. That's why, you see, this is the language of a father and not of a mother. And that's why he picks, changes his metaphor for us. Because there are occasions when fathers have to give warning words. Unless someone goes off the track. And that's a word of warning. And he notice every one of you. So at some point in life, we're all going to need this. And sometimes we might need the exhortation. And sometimes we will need the comfort. And on other occasions, we might need the charge that's there. And we're going to need the words of all of this. Every one of you. And every saint of God needs something, says Paul. And he says, that's what they gave. And what was the purpose? That was the character of the care in verse 11. Its purpose is given in verse number 12. That ye would walk worthy of God. What a lovely phrase that is, eh? To walk worthy of God. Lives consistent with our God. Work, walk, walk worthy of God. Consistent with his character. That might be reflected in the little life that you and I have, something of the character of the God that we say that we know. That's what this would mean for us. That we would have his ultimately his approval if we are walking worthy of God. We are representatives of him, reflecting something of him in the way that we live. That's what he's driving. And so it is, it is, it is that we would walk worthy of God, lives consistent with God. But it's not only that, lives consistent with our. Calling. Notice the statement that comes next. In here, that he who hath called you. The day you and I heard the gospel and responded to it, the effectual call of the gospel, we realized we were being called to something. It was a life that was different to the one we had before. That was implicit in the gospel that we heard. The life that is changed. That was our call. And every saint of God was called. In the gospel. And not only that, he says our lives consistent with our destiny, called us unto his kingdom and glory. Well, what future is that? He's going to touch on this, he's already done so. He's talked about waiting from his son from heaven in the previous chapter. We'll get to our, our verses at the end of this chapter in a moment. And you know that every chapter has this. Uh, well, there's a kingdom and glory. And as a kingdom, there is a subject we are there to, that we might obey. But as to the glory, that we might wonder, be able to display something and bear something of his glory. Remarkable, he says. Now, you've been called to that, says the apostle. And the reason why there are words of exhortation and comfort and charging is that we might be consistent with that before we ever get there. We might live now in the light of the kingdom that's yet to be. Now, he says, that's why I moved among you as a father who would exhort his children. Now, we move into the second half of this, and we're going to, well, we've only got 10 minutes left. We will get there, so right. And the, the, you will, we'll, 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 we'll be good, I hope. Um, so I want to notice, please, that the, the, what was the effect of this one? I want to notice, number one, that the Thessalonians would change. They were changed. This, uh, this work of God among them, there in Thessalonica, in, in Acts 17 and 18, had resulted in a change. And the basis of the change is given to us in verse 13. He says, we thank God without ceasing, ceasing because you receive the word of God. I want to notice, first of all, the character of the gospel. They received the word of God. They didn't receive opinion or philosophy or politics, worst of all. They have received the word of God. So we should be unashamed in our presentation of the scriptures. 
You know, the word of God, the verses of the Bible should have a prominent place in, in, in the work that we do. And whether it's in public preaching and teaching or however we do it, the word of God should be very center. As you'll notice right through this, the word of God, he says, it's truth. The word of God, he emphasizes it to That's the very character. And they received it. Now, notice, just please the language that he uses. They received not they receive it not as the word of men, but as in truth, the word of God. And then he goes on that you that believe. The thought of receiving is this is welcoming to the heart. It's freezing cold outside, as we all know. And, and if you open the back door, we've well, got any door in the house, frankly, the back or the front, the other back door in the house, the cold air rushes in. I cannot tell you tonight that I receive the cold air. In fact, I hate it coming in. But it comes in, but I don't receive it. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you is this is not, not some sort of some passive thing. There is a requirement to welcome it in. And that's the, how you and I responded to the truth of the gospel. We recognized the wonder of it and we welcomed it in. That's what it meant. And he says, if you want to really drive home, he says, what you believe, a total and absolute trust placed in it. And in that moment, you and I felt we, 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 we knew what it was. To be saved, born again. Now, can I just pause for a moment? And I don't know who will ever listen to the recording of this. And maybe even someone sat in the hall tonight, and you've never received the incredible message of the gospel, the Savior, and welcomed, believed. Can I just tell you tonight? It's the greatest thing you could ever do, and to trust Christ, to welcome, and to believe. Knowing that he can be your savior is the greatest thing because it is absolutely life changing and it is destiny changing. That's the wonder of it. And a living savior can be yours by simply welcoming him in it, receiving, believing. That's what they did the receipt of the gospel and the effect of it, which effectually works. Not just the language. Now, the tense is this it continually effectually works. Now, there was a moment when these Thessalonians believed. And, and that, at that very moment, they were saved. They were destined for heaven. Their sins were forgiven. They had been justified, redeemed. And we think of these wonderful gospel words, and it was theirs, there and then, completely. But that was God wasn't finished. That same word was still working. And you and I are still work in progress. We are changed. The language, again, of, of, of 2 Thessalonians 5, we are changed from glory to glory as by the Spirit of the Lord. But God is still working through us. And what's he working with? The same word that converted you. The word of God that changed your destiny is the same word that changes the life continuously. It worketh effect, effectually working in us. And so we should expect that we should change. We didn't all change in one moment, one night, that was done. As a site, we're still working progress, and it is effectually working. Now, that's 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 the basis of the change. Now, what was the evidence? The first thing, the evidence of their change was this: in their conduct, verse number fourteen, they became followers of the churches of God, which were in Judea. What an example! That's the thought. Behind. They became imitators, imitators in doctrine, in practice, in conduct, and interesting in the languages, the churches of God. They were in, as it says here, they were the, 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 in Judea. So they were these companies of God's people around Jerusalem, the Jerusalem area geographically. But, you know, they, they had an independence. They are not called the churches of Judea. Notice that. There's no geographical location for them. Well, they were based in Judea, but they're not called the churches of Judea. The churches of God. They were precious to God. They have been purchased by and they were accountable to him, and so they recognized the preciousness of that, and they recognized the security. Notice the language that he uses we are in Christ Jesus. And every saint of God is eternally secure in a risen Savior. That's the wonder of this. Now, since they recognize that, now these, these believers therefore became the imitators, the followers of that, and their conduct became marked by this. You could have spotted them out. Recognize them because of this. But notice not only that, there was not only the evidence of their conduct, but the evidence of their continuance. 
They faced persecution. They faced persecution. In verses 14 down to verse 16. You have suffered. I want to notice just four things about their persecution for a moment. I want to notice number one, that persecution is in fact universal. He says they were persecuted by the Jews, but you from your own countrymen. So they faced, the churches in Judea faced persecution from one particular quarter, and you facing persecution from a different quarter. But you're both facing persecution. It may well be that when you go back to Acts 17 and 18, that the Gentiles in Thessalonica have been stirred up by the Jews from Judea. That may well have been the case, but the point is, Paul is, look, no matter where you are, persecution comes. We shouldn't be surprised. Paul says we shouldn't be surprised. It is a universal fact. But notice, secondly, that persecution is fundamentally, verse 15, anti-God. They please not God. I don't realize we must recognize tonight that when believers are persecuted, it is because men hate God. That is the fundamental. It is their attitude to God that is reflected in their attitude to you. And the world vents its view of God on the people of God. And let us just remember this. They did exactly to that to the Lord Jesus. Remember the language of the Psalms? The reproaches of them that reproach thee <clears throat> fell upon me. A man's pent-up hatred of God. They let total venting of it on the Lord Jesus. And so we discover this man's attitude to God is revealed in his attitude to his people. But thirdly, it was anti to the gospel. Verse 16, why is this forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved? You know what? The world doesn't want to see people converted. You think, well, hang on a second. Why would the world not want to see a man who was a thief converted to becoming an honest, hard-working man? Why would the world not want to see a man that was a drunkard and therefore beat his wife up to become a man of sobriety and a, and a man of loving care for his family? And why would the world not want to see a man who was a total philanderer but now actually behaving in a moral, upright, and, and, and profitable way? Why, why would the world not want that? The world doesn't want that because absolutely it condemns every thief and every liar and every hypocrite across the board. That's why. Because after all, it makes no sense. They don't want two men saved. Because every man saved is the condemnation of every man not saved. Because it tells me this, that every man that's not saved is reproved. Because they recognize that every man that is saved has said this, I'm hopeless, useless, worthless, but I found a savior who can meet my need. And every one of us tonight, when we came to Christ, we recognize our utter helplessness. And in simplicity, whether we were young or old, we were cast upon him. And it was a total leveling and a moment of humility. We recognized it was a savior that we needed. And I'll tell you this, the world outside will never get down on its knees. And that's why. That's why. So persecution is because men are into the gospel. But I want to notice the last thing he says to us. He says, they fill up their sins. And, they put to, and for their wrath is come upon them. Now, these are quite complex statements, the last ones. And, and I just want to just perhaps leave it like this with you. That persecution will be addressed. Will be addressed. Yes, the persecutor have accumulated their sins. God has held it to their record. Never forget that. And one day there is a day of settlement coming. Wrath is come. It's imminence and it's certainty. And if I might put it carefully, God will set the record right. He will readdress the balances. And this matter will be settled. And God will do it. And so they had stood firm in persecution. This was what had marked them. As the evidence of the gospel among them. Now, in our last moments, Mr. Chairman, please give me one minute, if I may graciously ask. I want you to notice the last thing he gives them. Verse 17, the Thessalonians were loved. Now, I want to 
notice, please. Paul leaves a fourfold encouragement for them. He says, brethren, verse 17, being taken from you for a short time uh, in presence, but not in heart, endeavor the more abundantly to see you face your face with great desire. Number one, the desire for fellowship. He wanted to see them. And we're not notice, please, that fellowship, first of all, is based on a common family, brethren, it says. Recognizing a common identity, a common origin, brethren together, a common belief, common basis for that. But not just this, please, that it also, fellowship begins in the heart. He says we might be separated physically, but not in heart. And if we're cold-hearted to one another, then we'll have no joy in seeing each other. I mean, it just sort of goes like that, doesn't it? It's rather simple tonight. If we have no love in the heart for fellow saints, for friends, we're not going to be bothered to see them. It sort of boils down rather simply, doesn't it, says Paul. And it's in the heart that I wanted to be with you. And even though we're separated by miles, he says, it's still in my heart, I want to be with you. And he said, and, that, and it was what sat in his heart that was the basis of fellowship. So we don't love the saints, we're going to have real trouble, aren't we? Because we haven't really got off square one as far as Paul is concerned, on the matter of fellowship. But notice number three, he says, fellowship isn't, I'm gonna, no, I'm going to get into deep trouble tonight, but I'm going to go for it anyway. Fellowship isn't virtual. Now, I'm not criticising putting this on, 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 the, on the, please don't, don't, don't tell me off after this. I'm not criticising. But he does talk about seeing them see your face. There is something very special about stuff that is face to face of meeting the people of God, of sat down with them. There is something very special. I am not belittling the technology and its benefits and, and, and its blessings. But let's not also forget there is something special face to face. And that's what the writer to the Hebrews writes. Not, you know, it says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. There is something precious about that. And not only that, fellowship, last of all in this, is fellowship is active. He says it with great desire. We wanted it. We wanted it. So the first encouragement he gives them is the desire for fellowship. But the second one, this is the, he, he will give them uh, on this, the, the source of encouragement, the desire of fellowship, the source of encouragement. Now, what does he say to them? He says, for, uh, 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 he says for verse number 19, for what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Now, the context is the coming of the Lord Jesus right at the end of that chapter. And I wonder whether he's even got in view but with that, the judgment seat of Christ. But, but in light of all of that, he says, what were they? They knew, he says, are our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing. They were an encouragement. That's the hope behind it, a constant expectation. He was encouraged when he thought of a day coming when they would be there at the coming of the Lord Jesus. And that meant something to Paul. That was something really precious to him. And not only that, he says, and joy. What delight they had in, he had in them. And I think they had in him. Can I just, can I just take it very simply to I do hope that we are an encouragement to one another. Oh, we'll see him again. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, the fact that everybody smiles probably means we've all fought it once or twice. But you know, we shouldn't, should we? We should have a joy. And now, how about this one? Crown of rejoicing. I wonder which of the saints you consider your crown of rejoicing. That'll get you thinking as you drive home tonight. And it's the victor's crown, it's the Stephanos. What you want at the games. They looked at these individual saints and saw as the language which we might use in good English. Trophies of grace, crowns of rejoicing. He looked at them like that. And they were to him such an encouragement. Is that how we see fellow saints tonight? Paul says, that's how I see you. As he wrote to these Thessalonian believers. But not only that, he hasn't finished yet. He's got his third encouragement, the anticipation of glory. Now, this is the first reference in the New Testament to a very key word. He says, are not ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? That word coming is the word parousia. 
It's the first occasion that comes in the New Testament. And at five past eight, we are not going to look at this word in detail. But all I will say to you is this, that it spans, I would judge, a period, not an event, it's a period. It's the rapture and all the events that go from there to his coming in glory, the coming of the Lord Jesus. Now, he's got to do with the rapture in chapter four. Well, that's, 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 that's February. So you've got to wait to February. For that. But I wonder why the Lord had come between now and February. Yeah, that's another thought. But, 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 but just for a moment, he said, that's the, the coming. Now he says, what? Now think about it. He says, the anticipation of this. And, and what does he think about it? He says, he, says, he took, are not ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ? But he's coming. You think the language of 1 Thessalonians 4, again, caught up together. And every one of us, I suspect, tonight have stood at a graveside of a dear saint of God, loved ones, family members, and they've gone to heaven. We laid their body to rest. And Paul says, one day, together. Together. Isn't that incredible? We will be reunited. Together. And we will together enter into the heavenly court. Then I judge is when will be fulfilled the language of Hebrews 2. I am the children that God has given me. And he will escort us, dare I say it, across the threshold of heaven. I am the children that God has given me. And in a day after that, we will come with him. With his saints, says Jude. We will come with him to be admired in all them that believe. And in that vast throng, the innumerable throng of the redeemed, men will see the glory of Christ. Because there will be a throng of people who had no right to be there. But he made it possible. What a wonderful thing that will be. Paul says, in the light of that, what an encouragement. We anticipate he's coming. And you're going to be there, says Paul. And last of all, he says, he says, what does he say then? For ye are our glory and joy. That's what he thought of the saints of Thessalonica. That's his appreciation of the saints. And in the light of the persecution that's gone in the earlier verses, he says, these are the things that keep me going, that, that encourage me along the way. You, he says, are our glory and joy. That was his attitude. They were precious to him. They were an encouragement to him. So as I say, as you drive home tonight, you can wonder who it is amongst the people of God are your glory and joy. And which one of them are you going to name as your crown of rejoicing? Because that's what Paul did to the Thessalonians. That's his attitude. And remember, there were those who whispered in the ear of these people, Paul, he's dodging. His message, not good. Paul says, no, this is what I was to you. That's what you and I should be to one another, as the people of God. And I trust tonight that God might just encourage. Now, I apologize, I've gone way over my time, so.